The more meat we eat, the more cows there are producing greenhouse gases. Welcome to E3.2, list the main greenhouse gases, their sources, and discuss their relative effects. So how do we know if something is a greenhouse gas? Well, what we do is pass infrared radiation, which is being radiated from Earth, and if it can pass through the molecule with no interaction, then it is not a greenhouse gas. So we can see here oxygen is not. If we switch it to nitrogen, which is what most of our atmosphere is made of, we can see no. We get to water, oh, we can see that water does absorb some of the radiation, which causes the vibrations in the bonds, and then it re-emits it. And if we look at CO2, yes, and methane, yes. So those are three greenhouse gases that we're going to add here. CO2, methane, another one called chlorofluorocarbons, um, N2O, dinitrogen monoxide, nitrous oxide, or otherwise known as laughing gas, and water. So let's take a look at their sources. In terms of CO2, obviously burning. If uh, we take a look, here are some common combustion reactions. Um, so here, burning coal produces CO2. This is natural gas or methane uh, being uh, burned. Uh, this would be more like your fuel, um, octane. So those types of things are causing CO2. Deforestation would be breaking up uh, even larger um, organic molecules and producing CO2. And uh, that's related to forest fires, but forest fires are, of course, the natural cycle that happens, uh, maybe from lightning strikes, etc. Deforestation is us knocking it down, and primarily it's knocked down for the production of pasture land. Uh, decay is another factor. When anything decays, it also releases CO2. In terms of methane, the breakdown of grass in animal stomachs is one another cause. So a cow or a sheep, um, the animals that have a part of their digestive system called a rumen, um, inside here they have certain bacteria that produce methane. So cows and other ruminants end up burping and expelling methane as they eat. And so um, this is half natural and half um, unnatural because the number of animals we have surviving now or living now that are ruminants is inflated. It's, it's beyond any natural um, balance because they're produced in a factory food system primarily. So the red sort of, the red in all of these represents the man-made sort of influence and the green is the natural sources. Um, rice patties again is half and half um, when rice is being grown in, in rice patties, there's some methane being produced inside the patties. In terms of CFCs, you don't really see this much anymore, but CFCs are basically fluorine and chlorine attached to carbon. That's why they're called chlorofluorocarbon CFCs. And you'll find those not as much anymore, but they used to be quite frequently used in the 80s in aerosol cans. And then as soon as they sort of started putting in laws against it, they fell off um, out of use, they were outlawed. But they're still used in some countries around the world, uh, even illegally, because they're so cheap. Uh, so they were used in old fridges, old air conditioners, as solvents and cleaners, as foaming agents and fire extinguishers, and propellants and spray cans. But again, now they're generally not used. Um, nitrogen monoxide, or sorry, dinitrogen monoxide, uh, is produced primarily by bacteria and that is sort of influenced a little bit by using more nitrogen-based fertilizers. So there's a whole nitrogen cycle if you've ever studied it before, but there are several ways that nit um, N2O is produced throughout the cycle. You don't have to know the specifics of that for IB. Related to this is organic farming. Some people are choosing organics because it does produce less uh, dinitrogen monoxide than industrialized um, intensive nitrogen-based fertilized farming. Onto water, evaporation is definitely the major reason we have water inside our atmosphere. And if we take a look at contributions to global warming, we can see that 50 to 60 percent is CO2, so that is the major 
contributor, followed by methane and CFCs, N2O, and water. It's just a dash here because basically water is not considered to be a global warming contributor at the moment. Even though water is a greenhouse gas, a greenhouse gas doesn't necessarily mean something bad. We do need the greenhouse effect to make this planet livable. So it's not always a bad thing. But here, the amount of water in the atmosphere on average stays fairly constant. It's increasing very slightly as the temperature of the atmosphere increases, but overall the, the effectiveness that that contributes to global warming is fairly ne uh, negligible. So their effectiveness, let's go on the end here. So the effectiveness depends on their abundance. In other words, how much of this, of each of these gases is actually in the atmosphere? and then it takes a look at the ability to absorb infrared. So, for example, methane is about 30 times more effective than CO2 at absorbing radiation. However, since there is far less CH4 in the atmosphere than CO2, its contribution ends up being less. So you could sort of imagine that in, in this case here, methane is generally going to be absorbing more of these photons that go by and if we were to build an atmosphere basically what we could do is we could say it's like this even though CH4 may end up per molecule absorbing more photons because there are far fewer of them uh, then CO2, CO2 ends up being the major contributor to climate change. Now this is a question that comes up. Uh, why do CO2 emissions rise and fall each year? So if you take a look here, this is uh, the NASA readings. So you can see here that it, the red shows the measurements per day and They've just graphed that over the past 50 years or so. And then the black line is just the average. So why does it go up and down? Well, the amount of CO2 in the air is largely dependent upon photosynthesis. And that happens more in the spring when plants are growing. So if you don't know what photosynthesis is, you definitely should memorize this. It's water plus CO2. This happens in plants. They take in water through their roots and CO2 through their leaves. And they produce glucose and oxygen. And then in the fall, the plants decay, thus releasing the CO2. So in a simple, it's not always exactly like this, but it's, you can sort of envision it as a simple reversal of what happens um, in, let me make that large, in the spring with photosynthesis. This one is called cellular respiration. And so you can sort of see how CO2 would rise because it's being produced in the fall, and it would sink in the spring because it's being consumed and trapped into glucose inside the plants.